Hey everyone, welcome to Singularity Computers Client Build 14 Part 2. As you can see, the custom paint is now complete. In this part of the build log, I'm going to install all of the main components. I'm then going to move on to starting on the water cooling loops and custom wiring, and I'm also going to take a look at some of the components which I haven't already covered. But I'm going to start by taking a good look around at the custom paint job. A lot of work went into the custom paint, and I'm really happy with the way it's turned out. As you can see, I've managed to get a nice high gloss, almost mirror finish on the clear coat, which really helps the metallic paints to stand out. To some extent, the more high gloss the clear coat is, the more visible the metallic in the paint will be. And actually, with metallic paints, if you don't use a clear coat at all, the metallic in the paint often you know, can't even be seen. So for metallic paints, a clear coat is really critical. Now, I've buffed all of these panels inside and out, and I spent a lot of time doing that, but I found it really didn't make much of a difference. I was actually able to get this finish, or almost this finish, straight off the gun. And there's two main things that go into getting a good finish. The first is surface prep. And, you know, there's two parts of surface prep. One is sanding, making sure you've got a good smooth surface to paint onto, but also making sure that that surface is clean. Then after that, and I found this is incredibly important, is how you have your gun adjusted. And this comes down to experience and also, you know, getting to know the particular gun you are using. Too much air and not enough paint, you're going to end up with a sandy, gritty finish. Too much paint and not enough air, you're going to end up with a lumpy finish and even runs. Either way, it takes a lot of work to repair a lot of sanding. So finding that perfect balance in between is extremely important for a good finish. For buffing my custom paint jobs, I have a buffing attachment for my drill. Generally for paint, a big flat round buffing attachment is used on an angle grinder or similar rotary tool, but because I'm dealing with small panels, I need a smaller buffing attachment. And you need to use a cut and polish. I use a high quality car cut and polish, which also comes with a finer polish. And I usually go over it twice with the cut and polish and then once with the finer polish. You can actually also do all of it by hand, but you're going to have to work a lot harder to get a good result. Now a lot of people have commented on this screen, so I thought I'd just briefly talk about why it was chosen. The client sent me a reference and I matched up the color. Always when I'm sent a reference, I go into the paint shop and look through all of the different colors until I find the right one and there's literally thousands of colors to choose from. And I agreed with this choice of green from the start because what I was after personally, once I found out what the color scheme was going to be, was a subtle green. Because this is not a theme build and the custom paint job is just to complement the case and the components. And if it's too overbearing, it's just going to take from the rest of the components and really stand out too much. And there's so many bright greens with a lot of yellow in them, toxic green, alien green, which would work really well for certain theme builds. But for this build, they would just look really unusual. And then at the other end of the scale, you have greens with a lot of blue in them, the darker greens, which just look really unusual in metallic. And they also didn't match up very well with the charcoal or black that we've also used. So this green was nicely in the middle between the two and it was also really the most subtle green out of all of the greens that I looked at. So it worked out nicely. And I found as I've started to install more of the black panels, it's balancing out the green. The green is becoming a lot less noticeable and considering that most of the components that are going into this case are black, by the time the system is complete, the green is going to be a whole lot less noticeable. So I've removed the outer panels of the case and it's now time to start installing hardware. And now the build will start to move a lot more quickly. I'm going to start by installing the motherboard and graphics cards onto the motherboard tray. And I just love cases with removable motherboard trays. It makes things so much easier, mainly for building water cooling loops, because the co most complex parts of a lot of loops 
uh, on the motherboard area because that is where the bulk of the water cooling components are. I mean, if you take a look, once the graphics cards are installed, there is going to be eight water blocks in extremely close vicinity. So being able to do all of that tubing up outside of the case really makes things a lot easier. So I've installed the motherboard and graphics cards and I've temporarily installed the motherboard tray into the case. So I'll remove it again once I start on the water cooling loops. And I have actually started on one of the loops. You can see that I've tubed up between the graphics cards. And the reason I've done that at this point is because to install the graphics cards, the, this tubing needs to be installed first because you obviously need to move the graphics cards away from each other to be able to get this tubing into position, which means the graphics cards need to be out of the slots. You can see that I'm using one of the amazing looking EVGA SLI bridges in this build, which is going to go nicely with the Tri-SLI Titans. It's also going to fit the color scheme because it has green LEDs. And you can see that it matches up nicely with the aesthetics of the motherboard configuration, you know, particularly the memory water box. It has a lot of similarities, so it matches up nicely overall. Now here I have the 560 millimeter radiator mounting brackets, the 2.5 inch drive cage, 3.5 inch drive cage, and switch panel. Now there's quite a number of parts of the case panels and components that I've painted that I'm not actually going to be using. But, you know, I've still painted them and I'll send them to the client just in case the client wants to make changes to the build in the future. I'm only going to be using the 2.5 inch drive cage because there's only two SSDs going into this build. There's no 3.5 inch drives. So this is the switch panel for the power and reset button and also optionally for some front panel connectivity. And I've re-sleeved the wiring for the power and reset button and I've gone right up over the back of each of the switches with heat shrink. And you need some of the larger heat shrink sizes to do this, but it really cleans them up because it's such a mess at the back of those switches with the plugs and all of the wiring. And at the other end, I've done something that I saw in another build recently. It was actually a build that came into my workshop to have a custom water cooling loop installed. And in, in the place of all of those little connectors, which I've never liked, they're always such a mess and so difficult to deal with, I've installed two USB connectors and they just plug straight into the motherboard, which makes it so much cleaner and easier. So just a brief look at the SSDs before I install them. Going into this build is two Samsung 840 Pro Series 512 gigabyte SSDs. And these have a read of 540 megabytes per second and a write of 520 megabytes per second. And I'm going to be installing them in RAID 0. There will be performance results towards the end of the build log. So I've installed the SSDs around the back of the case, which we'll take a look at later in the build log. I've now also installed the pump and reservoir configurations and power supplies. Now I positioned the pump and res configs and drilled the holes for them in the first part of the build log. At the top I've used bits power reservoir mounts and I've had to pack them out to the same level as the mounts at the base. The spaces I've used are 10 millimeter nylon spaces and the best place to pick these up are probably on eBay. Just search nylon spaces and you're better off getting yourself a whole collection of different sizes. I use these all the time for mounting different components. They're a really handy thing to have. At the base, I decided to use the rubber anti-vibration mounts mainly to protect the paint job. Not so much to prevent vibration because I've actually never really had vibration problems with D5 pumps, no matter what configuration I've used them in. You can see that I've positioned the power supplies towards the back of the case. I'm going to then have the radiators and then the fans at the front. And there's a number of reasons I did this, it's because I want to have the fans visible on this side of the case. So it will appear that the fans are taking up the entire top and bottom compartment and that's really going to help to clean up the aesthetics. And also because I obviously want the wiring hidden around the back of the case and the wiring is going to be nicely hidden in behind the radiators. And there is another small thing to consider and that is that the user is most likely going to be on this side of the case. 
obviously on the side panel windows side so you don't want the hot air blowing across towards the user. I have here the two Black Ice SR1 560mm radiators, the Noise Blocker Black Silent Pro PK2 140mm fans, and the two 560mm radiator mounts for this case. Now I don't often use 560mm radiators. The last time was back in client build 8 in the TJ11. And the reason for that is not many cases actually fit them. But wherever I can, I like to use the largest radiators possible because it means using less radiators, which means cleaner water cooling loops. And for this build, I just wanted to keep the loops as clean and as simple as possible and use a single radiator per loop. So I'm using one at the bottom for the graphics card loop and one at the top for the CPU, motherboard and memory loop. And because these are 560mm radiators, that is going to be plenty to cool these components. The Black Ice SR1 is designed for silent configurations. It has a 9 FPI. The fans I'm using run at 1200 RPM, 54.7 CFM, 1.295mm H2O and 20 decibels. I actually had a little bit of trouble installing the fans and radiators in the top compartment. The radiator mount didn't fit in the top compartment by about 5mm, one of the case panels were in the way. And I had a couple of options, I could have modified the radiator mount or the case panels. And it would have meant, you know, cutting either one. And I didn't want to do that because that would mean going back and repainting the panel that I modified. So instead I decided to pack out the radiator mounts and I did it at the top and bottom to match. And again, I've used nylon spacers and I had to pack it out by five millimeters. To mount the fans, radiators, and also the radiator mounts, I've used the black M4 button head Allen key bolts that I usually use in my builds. For the fans and radiators, I use 35 millimeter bolts, which I cut down to approximately 32 millimeters. For the radiator mounts, I actually had to modify them to use the M4 bolts because the stock threads were six by 32 and I just didn't want to use the stock screws. The heads were too small and they would have just chewed up the paint and made a mess. And I prefer the look of the M4 button head Allen key bolts. So I just drilled out the threads entirely. Initially I was going to tap M4 threads, but I just decided to use nuts on the other side. And I've used M4 washers throughout. I've oriented the radiators with the inlets and outlets at the same end as all of the components so that the loops are as short as possible. And thanks to the size of this case, there was plenty of room to make that possible. I've removed the motherboard tray from the case again, and I'm now going to continue working on the water cooling loops. And I'm going to tube up between the CPU, motherboard, and memory water blocks. I'm going to take you through the entire process. I know I've done this many times previously, but this time I'm going to focus on the thing that I've had the most questions about, and I've had so many questions about this since I did it for the very first time when I built Nighthawk. Now, what is most off-putting about building a configuration like this for most people, and for some people it makes building configs like this impossible, is knowing exactly what you need to purchase, because fittings are very expensive, and you know, you don't want to have to go experimenting and purchasing more than you need. So the information I'm going to give you applies to really any tubing routing and any five water block configuration. If you're doing a three water block configuration then just go for about half of the fittings that I'm going to recommend. I'm going to put links in the video description to all of these components so make sure you check out those links. So first of all you need a hard tubing fitting and I highly recommend BitsPower C48s because they're the shortest hard tubing fitting out there. The reason you need a short fitting is because you're dealing with components that are very close together and fixed in position and you need to divide the fittings when you're assembling the config to get the tubing in between which means you also need to divide the components. And if you have longer fittings it means you need to put more pressure on the components, you can end up damaging them. And you also don't need the strength of longer fittings or compression fittings because again the components are fixed in position and they're so close together that they support the configuration. Now when it comes to the number of 
hard tubing fittings you go into need, multi-link fittings. You just need to count the inlets and outlets in the configuration. And I have five water blocks, which means 10 inlets and outlets. And that also goes for the 90 degree fittings. So for this config, I'm also going to need 10 90 degree fittings. Next, you're going to need extension fittings. And normally this would be the most difficult part of choosing components because depending on the configuration you go for, the extension fittings you are going to need are going to be completely different. But the following extension fittings should cover any configuration. Two 10 millimeter fittings, four 15 millimeter fittings, four 20 millimeter fittings, and two 30 millimeter extension fittings. So you're also going to need 90 degree fittings and you can go for 90 degree single rotaries or 90 degree dual rotaries. Some people prefer the aesthetics of 90 degree dual rotaries, but 90 degree single rotaries are cheaper, they look cleaner and they show more of the tube. So that is what I recommend. And finally, you're going to need acrylic tube. And if you go for the Bitspower C48s, as I recommended, then you need to go for 12mm OD, 10mm ID acrylic tube. And the cheapest way of doing things is just to get yourself a 500mm length of acrylic tube and then cut out the lengths you need. And a length of that size will also allow for some error. But if you don't want to have to cut and sand the tube, you can get yourself some pre-cut lengths. It is a bit more expensive though, so you, so you can get Bits Power Crystal Link and it comes in four different sets of three pre-cut tubes. Two slot, three slot, four slot and five slot. And the slots refer to the expansion slots on your motherboard because these are actually designed for tubing up between graphics card water blocks. If you get yourself one of each set, that is going to be plenty for any configuration. So you can see that I've moved on to the assembly. A lot of people have certainly figured out hard tubing at this point. There is so many great examples out there now for beginners of how to use hard tubing. I mean, there's some incredible builds. I think that what we can do with hard tube is really beyond anything we could do with soft tube. The uh, aesthetics you are able to create with hard tube is really unlimited. I mean, there's so many things you can do also considering the ability to bend hard tube. I think this is going to be the easier part for a lot of people because you know now that you know exactly what to purchase you're going to have what you need and it's just a matter of assembling it. So at this point you need to figure out your design, your tubing routing and first of all you need to figure out the inlet to the configuration and the outlet from the configuration where they need to be. And this depends on the design of the rest of your water cooling loop and where you have your other components positioned around your case. Radiators, reservoirs, pumps. So, you know, this really touches on a subject I've also covered many times previously, which is how to build the cleanest possible water cooling loop. You can see that I'm now doing a quick cleanup and I often do this while I'm building my systems always every you know 10 minutes or so I'm cleaning up and the reason I'm doing it now is because I know that I'm not going to be able to get to a lot of this once I start installing tubing and continue installing the rest of these fittings and I don't want to leave any finger marks behind fingerprints because particularly on the nickel I mean I haven't seen it on bits power fittings but the nickel plated water blocks and you know really any metals are just etched by fingerprints because the oils on your hands are acidic and you know you can see them months later so it's just not something I like to risk with client builds but I've now almost finished installing the fittings and obviously once you've figured out where the inlet and outlet is going to be you need to figure out the tubing routing in between and depending on the amount of water blocks you've used you have a number of different options and I like to go for a configuration that is either symmetrical in some way or just suits the particular aesthetics of the system that I'm building. So you can see I have a little bit of symmetry here I have basically two tubes that are on the same angle 
and then two tubes outside of that that are kind of fanning out a little bit. So I think it's going to work nicely. This was actually really the only option I could go for. I mean, I could also have gone to the lower opening on the memory water block on this side, but it didn't really work out too well. You know, I didn't like the options that that gave me. But, you know, from what I've mentioned, it gives you an idea of how many different ways you can, you know, configure something like this. So I've now installed all of the acrylic tube and you can see how easy that was. It was just a matter of turning, one, angling one of the fittings out, pushing the tubing in and, you know, because these fittings are sh so short, it just makes it so much easier. If I was using Bitspower C47s, which are twice the length of these fittings, it would have been a lot more difficult. You know, I would have been levering the components apart, putting a lot of pressure on them. So the, this fitting is definitely the best way to go. Now, some of you might be wondering how I managed to get the correct heights with these extension fittings, because the extension fittings that I've listed for you only give you five millimeter intervals, and it only takes them being a millimeter out and the tubing is going to be on angles and it's going to look terrible and even possibly leak. And it just so happens that if you're using EK water blocks, it always seems to work out that five millimeter intervals are perfect. You can also get 2.5 millimeter intervals by using different bits power fittings. And if you have big problems, you can also use the telescopic fittings. But as long as you're using EK water blocks, you shouldn't have those problems. So the configuration is now complete and I've reinstalled the motherboard tray back into the case. And what you need to do once you complete the config is go around and check all of the fittings and make sure that they're tight, including the multi-link fittings. And then also go around and make sure that the acrylic tube is firmly inside each of the fittings. And I actually like to get a torch and get the light in on an angle and you know actually see that the acrylic tubing is hitting the backs of the fittings because you know sometimes it doesn't even though it feels like it does and then you're going to end up getting leaks but that's it for this part of the build log thanks for watching please subscribe like and favorite if you want to see more